Morning in progress. Santosh, you can start. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Hi, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and uh, everybody attending today. Thank you for taking time out of your day to attend this webinar on community and faith-based approaches to addressing disasters and the climate crisis in South Africa. Uh, it's an often neglected topic, even though quite literally climate change um, is all around us and affects us every day in every imaginable way. So it's um, quite useful that we've got such an illustrious uh, lineup of panelists today to share their perspectives on how community organizations have been responding to this imperative. On behalf of Professor Busisibe Nkama, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the Head of the College of Health Sciences at UKZN, I'd like to welcome you to this public webinar. Uh, my name is Santosh Pillay. I'm affiliated to uh, the discipline of psychiatry at UKZN and I'm a clinical psychologist. I work full-time at King Dini Zulu Hospital Complex in Sydenham in Durban. And uh, I'd like to thank UKZN and the College of Health Sciences in particular for inviting me to moderate this webinar today. In light of the recent devastating floods in KZN, the purpose of this webinar is to raise awareness about the unique role that community and faith-based organizations play in the provision of relief measures, but also in supporting and building resilient communities against the backdrop of what is increasingly becoming devastating climate change. And each attendee today brings a unique perspective based on their location in terms of the organization that they belong to and how they've been providing solutions to climate change and disaster responses in this country. I think it goes without saying, given the recent flooding, especially in this province, that this is a topic that we can no longer ignore and one that we must engage with in all earnestness. This webinar has actually stemmed from the publication of a very important study, which has been led by Dr. Andrew Tumita from the Center for Rural Health at UKZN and several of his other colleagues, including Busisibe Nkama, Yoshan Mudli, Rashida Davids, Jonathan Burns, Tafad Zwanashe Mabuhaudi, Albert Modi, and Rob Slotto. And this study was published in the journal PLOS Climate in April this year. I want to just give a brief summary of the study by Tumita and his colleagues, because it really provided the catalyst for us to have this conversation today and very important findings that came out of this uh, massive data set that they had worked through. Tumita and his colleagues investigated the association between exposure to multiple disasters and the first onset of depression using a nationally representative data from the South African National Income Dynamics Study between 2008 and 2017, which consisted quite impressively of over 17,000 participants. They found that 17.3% of those participants were exposed to a disaster during that study period, with particularly interesting findings related to mental health. So firstly, they found that exposure to community disaster was associated with first onset of depression. However, the proviso here is that a single exposure was unlikely to lead to depression. Their study was about cumulative exposures to community disasters, since all of us are likely to experience multiple disasters in our lifetime. And a case in point again is KZN, given that we were ravaged by flooding twice in just the last two months. Their second finding was that there were particular groups of people who were most at risk. And these were people who were female, Black African, from a low income group, and had low levels of formal education. Vulnerability to depression was therefore significantly more pronounced amongst people in these social categories. Thirdly, the authors argue that disasters should not be separated according to natural or human-made disasters since there will always be a human-made aspect to all disasters. And in fact, when they included xenophobia, which is often a human-made disaster in the definition of disasters, the authors found an increasingly negative impact manifesting in people's mental health. And xenophobic violence is included in the definition of disaster in South Africa. Finally, and this is where this brings us to our webinar today, 
Tomita and his colleagues found, interestingly, that individuals who thought that religion was important in their life were protected against negative outcomes. They are therefore increasingly, we increasingly see the protective factor of religion in people's lives and how it boosts resilience and psychological well-being. This speaks to the importance of faith-based organizations who are often the first actors and the first responses, responders and who often know the community the most as government and family interventions may not always be available. And that brings us to the webinar today. These FBOs and CBOs are often underestimated and often seen as only attending to the initial material needs of those affected by disasters. However, they are actually key players in mitigating adverse psychological outcomes and in fact, improving mental health and well-being. To unpack these issues, I would like to welcome our sterling list of panelists today, all of whom have diverse perspectives and vantage points about today's topic. They are Mr. Gabriel Manyangadze, who is a program manager and climate justice coordinator at Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. Prof. Jeff Harris, who chairs the board of Phoenix Zululand and is a researcher affiliated to DUT. Ms. Yasmin Raja, who is the director of refugee social services in Durban. Dr. Kosi Kobeka, senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town and a practicing Buddhist. And Dr. Intia Suleiman, a medical doctor and also founder of Gift of the Givers. I'm going to just check in with the organizers to see if Dr. Imtia Suleiman is here already. Hi, Santos. He's busy connecting now. So could we give He's him just connecting. a couple of few seconds? Thanks. All right. So while we wait for Dr. Suleiman, I would just like to thank everybody once again for attending today's webinar and encourage all of you to use the chat box, which um, I think everybody's familiar with by now, given that this is probably everyone's 1000th Zoom meeting, uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you have any questions or any comments that you'd like to make, feel free to pop it into the chat box. There's also the Q&A function, which you'll see on Zoom. Feel free to post an official question there, and any one of our panelists will respond to those questions in between them speaking. And I see Andrew has already started posting some links to NGOs that most of us on the panel today are affiliated to. So feel free if uh, you are so inclined to go onto the websites and find out more about each of these NGOs. So if you are interested in volunteering or getting involved in any way, that will also be appreciated. I think the importance of this webinar is to really raise awareness about how community organizations who are often right on the ground and at the grassroots are often the people who know best what's going on in people's lives and know best how to respond. And often because they might not be always affiliated to universities, might not always be researchers whose names are well known, often the innovations and the solutions that they've come up with on the ground are overlooked. So hopefully today we can begin a conversation where we start seeing some best practices come out of these organizations and we can all learn from each other. The reason I'm waiting for Dr. Suleiman is because he um, had to uh, respond to an emergency in Port Elizabeth early this morning. And I think it comes with the territory of working in Gift of the Givers. And though he was uh, further down the line, he asked to go first. So we are gonna um, indulge him and allow him to be the first speaker so that if he, that, if he is unable to stay for the entire duration of the webinar today, uh, he can slip out quietly. <laughs> okay, it's just written to me to say that it cannot connect on video. All right. But I think uh, that's fine. So uh, shall we accept his apology, Marianne, and move on? Let me just find if, if he can connect on audio, because we're fine with listening to him. All can right. Just check? Okay. Okay, Santosh is here. Let me just see. Great. I think while we wait for Dr. Suleiman. Sorry, sorry, hold on, he's just calling me. All right. Um, I think let me formally introduce Dr. Suleiman, even though he's probably a public figure that needs very little introduction. 
I think most people know Dr. Suleiman as the founder of the Gift of the Givers, which is a humanitarian organization, uh, but he is a medical doctor by profession, and he is in fact an alumnus of UKZN. Um, he's world renowned for his contribution to humanitarian aid nationally and internationally, and he's received a number of prestigious awards from as far afield as places like Bosnia, Pakistan, Malawi, and Portugal. Uh, the most noticeable and recent award included the very prestigious Order of the Grand Counselor of the Baobab, and this year, the Board of Healthcare Funders Titanium Lifetime Achiever Award for outstanding contributions to the healthcare industry in South Africa. Um, Dr. Suleiman is going to speak about the inspiration behind the establishment of his foundation and provide a couple of on-the-ground lessons learned during the recent disaster. Uh, Dr. Suleiman, thank you for joining us very much, and um, I hand over the mic to you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, okay, that's something. It doesn't show that here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Suleiman, for joining us today. I know that you're incredibly busy, and even as we speak, you're kind of on the ground attending to some issues down in the Eastern Cape. Um, we'd really love to hear from you about some of the inspiration behind setting up the gift of the givers and also some of the lessons that you've learned um, related to the recent flooding in KZN and how the gift of the givers has been responding to climate change. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay and sorry for stealing the position of the others before, before me. We are in, in P and, you know, they're in day zero. I had to fly in yesterday afternoon. I mean, this is a serious crisis here. The city is going to be out of water very soon. And there's almost 2 million people here that's going to be affected. So we've already started drilling and we're doing other things here. But to answer your question, Gift of the Givers is not something that I spoke about, what, thought about one morning to form an organization, to give it a name, to find some founding members, to, to uh, arrange some principles and say what we're going to do. Gift of the Givers is a very spiritual organization. The inception the founding of the organization, the instruction, the instruction of its founding was given to me by a spiritual teacher in Istanbul, who I met first in August 91. I loved what I saw there, and I went back in August 92. On a Thursday night, the 6th of August 1992, the spiritual teacher at 10 p.m., after a religious ceremony, looks me in the eye from the corner of the room. I'm sitting in the other corner, and he tells me in fluent Turkish, and I don't speak a word of Turkish but I understood every single word that he said in Turkish. He said to me, my son, I'm not asking you, I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Wakifil. Translated, it means gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures of any geographical location and of any political affiliation, but you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. This is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. And remember, this is a crucial statement. He said, and remember, whatever you do is done through you and not by you. The spiritual emphasis, the spiritual link was guaranteed there. I told you he spoke in Turkish, and I don't speak Turkish, but I understood everything he said in Turkish. And I asked him, how is it that when you speak Turkish, I understand, and when other people speak Turkish, I don't understand? He said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. I asked him next, you gave me this instruction, what does it mean? What am I supposed to do? When am I supposed to do it? I'm a doctor in private practice. I have three surgeries in a place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. So when am I supposed to do this? He told me one line, you will know. And the moment I walked out of that place on 6th of August, 1992, I knew exactly what to do. I was shown all the steps. We responded immediately. I gave my inspiration to respond to the civil war in Bosnia. The same month, we took in 32 containers of aid. In November, another eight containers of aid. And in 93, we designed the world's first containerized mobile hospital. The, uh, uh, unique South African technology, the first of its kind in the world, taken from Africa to Europe. And at that point, I then understood his message. Gift of the givers, in essence, was going to be a disaster response agency. That was going to be the bread and butter. That's what we were going to specialize in. And whatever else we did was secondary to disasters, not disasters itself. Disasters was number one. And subsequently, over a period of 30 years, we've built a profile of 21 different categories of projects. Not 21 projects, 21 categories of projects. So whether it's winter warm, giving out wheelchairs, intervening in hospitals, boreholes, agriculture, housing, counseling, hostage negotiation, 
whatever it, uh, we do, all different kinds of projects have been developed as a result around disasters. COVID became a very big project on its own. So initially, the, 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 we, although we were involved in South Africa, the marketing went a lot to international projects. And as part of the development, for the first time in 2004, we brought in primary health care teams. Before that, we had just material goods, tents, blankets, medicines, food, that kind of stuff we were doing. In 2004, we added primary health care teams. That was when we went to a place called Afun, in Northeast Somalia, at following the tsunami. In 2005, August, in responding to that famine in Niger, we went in with primary health care teams again. In 2008, we upgraded. The earthquake in Pakistan, we went with primary health care teams, went in with the uh, trauma teams, which means general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons. We also took for people, uh, gynecologists, theater nurses, ICU nurses. We followed that by post-op rehab teams. Later on, we had trauma counselors. And then we said, what's missing? The thing that's missing is search and rescue. And because of the Pakistan earthquake, we realized we had no search and rescue. And at that point, we started putting together teams for the search and rescue. And we applied it for the first time 12 January 2010, the earthquake in Haiti. Eight days later, on the 20th of January, eight days into the earthquake, we made world history. Never before in the history of the African continent has any team from the African continent taken anybody out of the rubble alive in an earthquake outside the continent. 20th January 2010, we pulled out 64-year-old Enazizi from the collapsed Catholic church. No food, no oxygen, no water, no medicine, fractured heat, eight days in the rubble, and our teams pulled out alive. The search and rescue teams were followed by the medical teams who said, leave this to us. Northern Hemisphere countries said, we can't work here. Everything is damaged. And the South African team stepped forward and said, leave this to us. And to the credit of everybody in Haiti, they said, if you want help, if you want assistance, if you want healing, go to the dream team. And the dream team is from South Africa. Mm. And over a period of time, we now are the most complete disaster agency in the world. Nobody can match us. Some people supply tents, blankets, and medicine. Some give primary healthcare teams. Some give trauma teams. Some guys do post-op rehab. Some guys do talk trauma counselors. Some guys do search and rescue. Some guys bring snuffer dogs. Some people build clinics and hospitals. Some people build houses. Some people put water. Some people put agriculture. We do all of the others above simultaneously in any disaster that we go to. And we've proven that over and over again. So we're the most complete disaster team in the world. We can get up a plane and start operating on the runway, setting up an ICU and a theater on the runway. We've got the equipment, we've got everything portable, and we've got teams who know how to do that. 2016, I swapped, I killed international marketing. There was too much of focus on international marketing, and people were missing what we were doing in South Africa. I didn't kill the project, I just killed the marketing. And 2017, June, we responded to the Nisena fire, which is it's two weeks ago, was that a one, well, a week ago. It was it was five year anniversary. We sent in two ladies who were our project managers. They coordinated the, the formation and putting together of 20,000 food parcels, blankets, hygiene packs, sanitary pads, diapers. And as we progressed, we brought in uh, some fire teams to support the firefighters. We took care of the firefighters, 1,200 of them, twice a day, providing them with liquids and energy bars and snacks for, for, for that period of time. We also brought in advanced life support paramedics. We brought in a special um, a medical specialist medical team that helped with moving of patients from Nisner to other hospitals and even delivered babies. Then people came to us and said, you know, the cats and the dogs are hungry. We need some cat pet food. We arranged pet food for the, for the dogs and the cats. Then somebody else came and said, there's a drought here. The sheep and the cows need food. The elephants in the park need food. The wild animals in the, in, in the wild need food. We arranged all that for them. And then somebody came and said, the bees have been destroyed. 22 billion bees have died. We need food for the bees that are alive. There's no plants. There's no, the pollen substitute is too expensive. We need sugar solutions. We need sugar. We arranged that for the bees. And then we funded them to buy 300 beehives, money for the plants to grow more plants, the pollen substitute and more sugar so the bees could thrive. And yesterday and in the week, the bee people sent me a message to say the center has grown, the research center that we supported them with. All the bees are back, more than 22 million, and the numbers are growing. And there's a lot of research and students and learners and university students and professors come there. And the bee learning has gone huge in the area. They're now expanding to other areas because the Cape honeybee is the most versatile bee in the world. 
it is haploid and diploid. So if the queen bee dies, they can manufacture their own queen bee, which has been very good for the environment, very good for the, 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 the surroundings, and it's been a massive improvement. And also they're teaching new beekeepers. There's 90 people on a chat now, and they're teaching new beekeepers, which is passing on of knowledge and upgrading skills in the area. From there, we responded to the drought in Beaufort West. We drilled when there was no water, nobody could find water, our team found water. And we put in water, pumped it into the Hamka Dam pipelines, by gravity brought it into the city and by the municipal reservoir systems delivered to the old city. At the same time, we started supplying Sutherland with fodder. In 2018, besides the fodder, all the water dried in Sutherland. We drilled 238 boreholes to resuscitate the farms and animals. The animal count dropped from 440,000 to 31,000. For the first time in January this year, the count is starting to rise. People are getting jobs again. People are being employed again. 2018, we got involved in day zero in Cape Town, moving in 300 containers of water from Joburg and Durban by ship and by road, and started drilling boreholes all over Cape Town and the Western Cape. 2019, we got involved in the drought in Makanda, and we're still there. And because of that, the Eastern Cape is now in the drought in P right now. And then in 2020, we got involved in COVID-19, we supported 210 hospitals, put up our own testing teams, put our, we had our own laboratories at, at reduced prices, put in PPs in all the hospitals. We started with infrastructure upgrades in all, uh, all of the hospitals. We put in um, uh, food for the hospitals. And at the same time, we put in high flow nasal oxygen machines, CPAP machines, uh, video laryngoscopes. And now we're able to catch up surgery in various hospitals. We look at starting the upgrade to Charlotte Makeke in two weeks' time. You know, it's, it's a 40 million rand upgrade. We're still upgrading other hospitals and we provided food passes to 1.2 million people. And then, of course, we supported the country in KZN with the, the unrest in, in, and the hunger in July 2021, delivered thousands of food passes to all aspects of KZN. And right now, we got are involved in the floods. In 11th April, the floods hit. The morning of 12th April, 5th April, my team started. From that day onwards up to today, Monday to Sunday, they've been supporting centers, individuals, families with bulk food for cooking, bottled water, hygiene packs, the, the sanitary pads, the diapers, mattresses, and blankets. And then hospitals, clinics, schools, calls for bottled water. We gave them that. And then uh, the, the, the talk that was, is in a mess. You know, the, the water system is completely destroyed. We drilled 15 bowls there already, and also drilling bowls in other areas that didn't have water even prior to the floods. In parts of Berylum, parts of Amzinto, Harding, uh, Madden Hill, our teams are busy working there. We're upgrading the schools that have been damaged. 600 schools have been damaged. The first few schools have been massive damage. We've given contracts of 15 million rand for the first few, first few schools to be repaired. We're doing what is called jetting, cleaning out all the stormwater drains in the schools, which are filled with sand and, and silt, which means later on, if there's another flood, then the drains will get flooded again and the schools will get damaged again. So we're cleaning that out. The health department has asked us to assist us. We're going to look at that. 180 million rand worth of damage to health facilities. And then, of course, in M the M4, uh, we, we, the, the, the communities got together to try to rebuild the bridge and using us as a facilitator for that. We're also providing uniforms, stationery, and food parcels for the kids at school. And that's basically our total involvement. We also brought in search and rescue teams and recovery teams. We brought in our own helicopters. We brought in our own equipment. And you know, we assisted in many areas. And you know, our, our inter intervention in KZN has been massive. So that's basically you know, our intervention and in, in, in what you have asked. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman. If I could just ask a, a final question before we, we, we let you go, is that when we listen to this amazing response that your organization has had and the inspiring story about how it started, I mean, what is the secret to success in terms of turning a community-based and a faith-based organization into such a massive uh, success in the way that you've managed to do with Gift of the Givers? My staff have passion. All my staff have passion. They, because they don't do this for the salary. If they do this for the salary, they're wasting their time. You know, and for example, they were working throughout COVID for two years. And then came the, before it, the floods came during Ramadan. And at the beginning of Ramadan, we deliver food parcels day and night and also food for breaking fast in the evening. So they were very, very tired when the floods came. So that the, the floods came on the 11th and that first Sunday was Easter Sunday. And they worked that whole week going through difficult roads and, you know, taking long hours to pass the traffic and bypass the cars and get to the people. It was very tiring. Come back at night, load the truck again for the next morning. And they were tired. So on Sunday, we told them, take a break. And an hour later, they called and said, we can't take a break. Purely at their own. No, no imposition. This was voluntary. 
Then they called back and they said, people are hungry, people are in difficulty, people are thirsty. We can't take a break. Our, our work ethic and what we are there for doesn't allow us to take a break. They all came back to work. They worked the whole Easter weekend, May Day, first May Day, the public holiday after May Day, the 27th of April, and they've been working nonstop from the 12th of April up to today. So to answer your question, it's about passion, it's about commitment to principle, it's about human humanity, and also it's about four important principles that we teach our teams. Spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. If every system in this country, government, corporates, public, religious leaders, community leaders, tribal leaders, if they have these principles, everybody will work with a passion to save and serve this country. Dr. Suleiman, a final, final question, which is, uh, and touching on what you mentioned about spirituality. I mean, how does your own spirituality play a part in how you think about climate change and disaster in this country? And, and is there an Islamic response to climate change in general? The, the climate is, nobody can control climate. Nobody can control climate. We can respond to climate change. Can anybody interfere with the weather and say, okay, you will stop the rain from coming? That's not possible. From an Islamic point of view, God says he controls the weather. He controls the land, rain, the atmosphere, everything. If you, man got no right, got no way to control that. What man can do is respond to the climate change. And to do that, you can't be fatalistic. You know, we have to be prepared. Do we have enough boats? Do we have enough trained paramedics, trained divers, walkie-talkie systems where the network gets knocked out? Do we put people on low ground, flood areas, or we put them on higher ground? Common sense. It's a common sense approach. You don't want to avoid God says, tie your camel. Have faith in me, but tie your camel. Don't jump in front of a moving car and say, you know what, I have faith in God and you get knocked over. That's called stupidity. You know, there's not faith. So it's got to do a balance of being rational and making arrangements. God always said, make arrangements. Yes, I will test you, he tells you, for all kinds of weather things. And, and we've seen the earthquakes and the tsunamis and hurricanes and the floods. So the common sense approach and part of faith is to serve human beings with love, kindness, and compassion. So the faith is tested or the people see the faith when they see somebody respond to them. Let me give you an example. And I'm time is going up. When we get to Transkai, one day, an old lady was standing with a stick. And as the food parcel got delivered to her, she said, I've been praying for one month and God sent his people to me. I knew he won't let me down. Nothing to do with climate change, to do with hunger. Same principle. We came and we gave the food parcel to the person and they said, God came to us. In the floods itself and in the COVID itself, wherever we went or we go, it's the same message. The green people have come. We know we wear green shirts. The green people have come. The people of God has come. God has answered our prayers. God has sent his people to us. That lady when we saved in the earthquake, in Azizi, when she got out of the earthquake, the first thing she said is, I love God. We will instill, instill hope in somebody several thousand kilometers away. And the second thing she said is, I love you. Spirituality is about love, humanity, compassion, and looking at the good at other people. People may have, oh, everybody has good and bad in, in them, but we enhance the good within people and don't focus on the bad. Thank you very much, Dr. Suleiman. Your passion and your enthusiasm and your selflessness is absolutely infectious. And I wish you all of the best down in the Eastern Cape where you are today. And on a personal note, I'm always proud to say that the gift of the givers stems from my own hometown of Peter Marisberg as well. So I know that your organization will grow from strength to strength. And thank you for taking the time for an extremely busy morning to join us on the webinar today. Thank you very much. And good thanks to everyone else there. Thank you. Um, Colleagues, I'm going to move on from that infectious energy of Dr. Suleiman to our next panelist, who is Mr. Gabriel Manyangadze, and introduce Gabriel a little bit more fully. He is a programs manager and a climate justice coordinator at the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. Uh, Gabriel, I hope you'll tell us more about that organization. It sounds very interesting. And uh, Gabriel's portfolio includes increasing the understanding of climate change among faith-based communities, and civil society. And Gabriel has previously been involved with the Zimbabwe Council of Churches. Uh, Gabriel, I understand that you have a PowerPoint presentation which you'll be sharing with us. So I'll hand over to you and um, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Sampashi. And a good afternoon, everyone. It is um, an honor for me to be speaking in this forum today. Um, 
speaking about um, SAFC, it is a multi-faith organization committed to supporting faith leaders and their communities in Southern Africa to increase awareness, understanding, and action on equal justice, sustainable living, as well as an understanding of um, climate change. We work right across um, all religions and also in all the um, Saudi countries. <clears throat> Um, in terms of our um, approach to work, we always want to connect directly to the people that have been affected by um, disasters. And therefore, when disaster struck in um, KwaZulu-Natal, we were there to also support um, the people morally. And in addition to that, we also had um, the support to agencies that are working on the restoration and repairs. And also we connect with the people that are on the ground. There, are, there is a core of people that we have trained on issues around um, climate change, as well as um, responses to the issues that happen in their local area. So these are the local advocacy groups that we support in terms of who to approach when we have a disaster, who to link up with, and also what to do when you get to meet those that have something that they can do. And under these circumstances, we continue to offer our spiritual and social support, and we call upon the Almighty to have mercy on us in terms of this disaster that has occurred in KZN. Looking at the impact of the flooding disaster on faith, different faith were affected differently and our different ways of worship were also affected because of the disasters. Therefore, the observance of faith rituals in the face of the loss was greatly affected as these could not be followed because of the disaster. I'm actually looking at um, the kind of um, responses that people had when the disaster struck. There are rituals that um, people of faith follow when um, there is a loss, when people are passed on. This could not be followed because of the disaster that was going on. However, this is where faith comes in to play a bigger role to support the families. Already Dr. Suleiman has mentioned that um, there is a direct connection of faith to the people on the ground. People of faith know each other directly. And therefore the response of a fellow uh, faith community member actually touches on the person that would have lost or has been involved in the disaster. So in this case, faith communities have been dispersed and this makes it also difficult to reach out, particularly when we're looking at the fact that this was a massive disaster which affected virtually everyone. However, in spite of um, what actually happened, we followed this up and we have a program which we call the We Have Faith, where we say we need to act now for climate justice. In April, we had a meeting where we were talking about the impending disasters and we had um, people that spoke about the situation that was coming on. And on this, the detail, they detailed the impending disaster which highlighted that there will be greater frequency and intensity of the storms and that they will spread further south into the Eastern Cape over time. One of the presentation that was quite key when we had this meeting, when we were talking about climate change was from one um, meteorolo meteorologist by the name of Juliet Gwenze from the University of Zimbabwe who noted that flooding will intensify around KZN and over time also to stretch further. And for us, this is a call that we also want to extend to all others and to the authorities to say, we know 
about all this and the authorities also know because I remember that the South African uh, Weather Service also gave a warning about the impending disaster. Now, it was our call as well to inform the people that those that were in low-lying areas, something might happen. Unfortunately, I think because certain things have not happened before, most people also because of the lack of the ability to change could not act even though they were aware that something bad was coming to their doorstep. Um, maybe the diagram that is on the screen shows that the trends of the severe tropical cyclones that have happened in the past. And if you note that right at the end, we now do have more tropical cyclones that will be coming through. And as um, the Southern African Faith Communities Institute, we say, this is something that we know. This is something that we are anticipating. Therefore, we are calling upon all people, people of faith um, and those that are in authority and those that can help to actually change the setup that we have in KZN and also the northern parts of um, Eastern Cape, because we are going to be experiencing this more and more. And as SAFSI, we are working with faith leaders to say, let us warn the members of our religion in terms of the choices of places where they're going to build their homes and also where they will set up their business, particularly when we're focused on the small businesses. And we, I would also want to say, what do the experts say? Jennifer Fischett of the School of Geography, Archaeology and Environmental Studies from the University of Witwatersrand actually gave a telling paper or she produced a telling paper that in the past, the tropical cyclones could not, that would reach what we call category five were coming in slowly and also with um, less frequency and less intensity. But in the past um, 20 years, this has increased in terms of both in intensity as well as uh, the frequency. And as um, in our program for the climate change program, we are saying we need to take heed of what science has already given to us and as people of faith, we are calling everybody that morally we have something that we have to do as far as assisting people before, before disaster struck. It is important for us to share with people of faith that there are areas that are most vulnerable to the disasters and to let them know that they need to move as was already mentioned earlier on, to safer places. And we are calling on the authorities to start implementing that because this is something that we are going to be living with over the next years. And therefore we need to be prepared. In terms of our, some of the faith responses, the people of faith through various communities responded in the provision of food packs as was done by the South African Council of Churches through the KwaZulu Natal Council of Churches. We find that um, find above the response in terms of the provision of food, some of our members, and in this case, I would want to identify Marilyn Chitarai of the, youth, the Hindu Youth Network, who actually realized that there are some groups of people that are not considered in terms of their responses. And these are the youths. When disasters strike, the youth will feel hopeless. And as a response, she started a program where she was asking the youth to write about their experiences as a way of psychosocial healing. And this is a program that is ongoing and it is giving the youth a platform to say, this is what happened. And to reach out to other youth and give hope. 
So when we have disaster striking, it is important to give hope to those that are affected. And this is also one of the things that we are doing to provide hope and to want to go ahead. Some of the youth lost everything that they had, they lost family, and therefore in the situation that prevails in South Africa at the moment, where even unemployment is rising, they lose hope. But with this kind of an intervention, we see that hope is restored and the youth would want to go on and they would also want to reach out and assist others in terms of uh, being able to cope with the disaster when it strikes. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of um, the South African Council of Churches, you'd find that they stepped in in terms of um, giving support to uh, families that had lost their loved ones and conducted free funerals with the support that uh, went up to almost 20,000, as well as also provision of um, water trucks and also delivery of um, critical areas of need for these people, like a provision of shelter, health and sanitation, such as toilets and sanitary supplies, food security, and the provision of power generators for the walls where people were sojourning at the time. I would also want to acknowledge at this point that um, the Mosepe Foundation extended um, additional support to the cause. And I would want to point out in this point that um, people of faith have a quick and direct um, intervention when disaster strikes. And therefore it is important that we also link up and act when something happens because we don't have the kind of protocols that government has. And therefore it means we are on the ground on less time and also we are responding to people that we, we know and also our response is personal to the people that are affected. And therefore it is one of the things that I would want to highlight that we need to continue to be present and we have been present throughout the disaster in um, KZN. And so the faith community is a faster conduit of assistance as it has a presence in the communities and responds to the needs of people personally. And this is very critical because it gives people the resilience to bounce back after a disaster. And SAC went on to even offer the work of witness where they supported people that have gone through the disasters and this has helped a lot more people to look forward with hope and also to respond to the situations that they face in a manner that is positive. The provision of halls, I've already mentioned that um, the church halls and other places of worship that were not affected by flooding were also offered to the survivors of the disaster as a temporary shelter from where they were processed by the officials for further assistance. And I think this is also one of the key things that um, comes to mind. When disasters strike, people would always want to associate with um, their faith or religious groups because there is a personal touch to their plight. And this is also what is offered by people of faith. In terms of the plan of action going forward, as I've already mentioned, that we are all well aware that this disaster is not going to be a once-off thing, but it is going to be a recurrent process because of the changing climate change and also of the changing our weather patterns within the um, UK and within KZN. We would say we need to intensify awareness on the dangers of stream bank homes. I think this is a point that we need to highlight that low-lying areas along the streams are not safe. It doesn't matter for who. We know people are affected differently and they are forced to be in those kind of situation because of what life has thrown at them. But it is important for people of faith to respond and urge the people to move to higher ground, to safer ground, 
so that when disaster strikes again, you will not be caught up in a similar situation where homes are swept away, where families disappear, and where we lose livelihoods as well as all that we have. We're also going to use um, the time of worship to share information on disaster preparedness. And also, as it is a well-known fact that it is known that disasters are impending, we'll need to engage the authorities to actually start planning differently. Dr. Sunimani mentioned that there is nothing that we can do about um, climate change, but there's something that we can do about planning where we can plan differently and have people at heart, advise them on places that are safer for them to live and also on places where everything that they are doing will be done in a safer mode. Thank you very much, over to you, Satoshi. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. I think you have really shared important information to us about how communities are much more engaged, swifter, on the ground, and attending to the very kind of practical needs that communities have very immediately after disasters. Um, before I move on to Prof. Jeff Harris, I just wanted to ask you, Gabriel, I mean, you spoke about providing and restoring hope. And I think one of the questions that went through my mind was that you know, how do, we, how do we do hope? How do we provide and restore hope in context of seeming hopelessness? Because when you share the other uh, graphs by the meteorologist, it almost seems uh, like kind of climate disasters are gonna become more and more frequent and more recurrent um, in the next couple of years. And, you know, given existing political failures to provide decent housing for people and uh, water and sanitation and electricity, et cetera, Many people, even before climate change and before disasters impact them, are already living in situations of hopelessness. So climate change and disasters kind of compound this uh, over and above uh, existing issues that people have. How does the church respond to these multiple challenges that seem to be attacking people from so many different directions? Uh, thank you, Santoshi. The response, as I said, is in all our faith groups, we have a personal touch in terms of when we worship together, we understand each other. And you'd find for most religions, we have what we call um, cell groups, home cell groups. So people are known to each other. And what we are also giving to people is the knowledge that this is going to happen. And also to actually share with them in issues at a uh, family level of disaster preparedness when we begin to see things happening, what should we do? Calling the neighbor, checking on our fellow um, faith community members, checking on what um, they are doing and where they are. And I think you'd find people that were identified to be missing, most of them were identified by the people that know them. So this is what we are saying, building a community that cares for each other, mm -hmm. a community that uh, wishes good for others. And therefore, it would mean when we are in a faith community, when we see somebody building their homes where there is a risk of uh, being affected by a disaster, we should be able to say out to them, this area is not good enough. And therefore, it helps. And as far as the youth are concerned, you'd find that the youth are the most vulnerable because once those that are looking after them, because right now you find most of the youth are being looked after by their parents. And when their parents are away, they need to be able to go on and um, actually live and have hope. And this is where I, uh, I was now saying the Hindu community is saying, let's write about our issues. Then people begin to say that they are not in it alone. There are others that are in there and they begin to offer solutions because the solutions that we want are not only solutions that are external, but we also want solutions that are inbuilt. Those people suggest to the, to the authorities to say, this is what we want. And also to begin to influence the political uh, situation in favor of a good life or a safe life for the peoples in the community. And I think this is what we are actually encouraging to engage the political leadership in our communities to say, we are at risk and you have a responsibility to respond to that. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. I think it really highlights the importance of um, building social capital amongst communities. 
um, but also how these groups not only offer mental health support to each other, but they can also become spaces for advocacy and activism um, in the long term. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. Really appreciate your insights. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Professor Jeff Harris, who uh, is an economist by training, but has taught and researched in the discipline of peace studies at uh, the Durban University of Technology uh, for a very long time, and he's been a researcher for over 30 years. Um, he's currently based at the International Center of Nonviolence, and his interests are around demilitarization and restorative justice. Um, Jeff is a Quaker and he chairs the board of Phoenix Zululand, which is a Quaker-led initiative, which has undertaken restorative justice education in the prisons of Zululand for 15 years. He will speak about the role of community-based organizations in mitigating climate disaster. But Jeff, if you'll allow me to ask a question off the bat, which is, what is a Quaker? <laughs> and what exactly is a Quaker response to climate change? Uh, please indulge my ignorance. <clears throat> Um, yeah, good question. Um, well, it's it's a church, um, and it it's, has origins going back to the 1650s in in England, when along with a lot of other um, organisations, well, uh, there was resistance to the to the state religion, and uh, very much. Uh, I mean, the religion was very much part and parcel of government, very oppressive, um, and very. Um, hierarchical, with priests very much in command. And so Quakers um, had a very different take on it. They said, look, um, individuals can connect with God directly. They don't need to go through a, through a priest. Um, they were very biblical people, um, probably a lot more so than Quakers are now. Um, so they took the Bible very seriously. Um, but uh, yeah, they focused on, on individual relationship with God. Um, but I think what's developed since then is, um, and perhaps we might call it more liberal Quakerism, they're not very interested in theology. So if you say, well, what do Quakers believe? If you ask 10 Quakers, you're going to get 10 very different question, uh, answers. Whereas if you think you ask perhaps a more orthodox, uh, uh, so within Christianity, for example, there'll be certain things that are very important. Now, Quakers aren't into, into belief in that sort of way. They're definitely into experience. So that many of them, and me included, would say, look, I experienced God in my life and things keep happening, which convince me that God loves me and God's got a role for me and, uh, and I've got to be true and, and follow that. And they're also very strong on action and especially peace, action for peace and justice. And that's what attracted me to them um, when I was probably feeling a little bit <clears throat> um, uncomfortable in the more traditional Christian circles, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Jeff, I really kind of uh, shed some light. I mean, is there a specific kind of response by the Quaker community to climate change and disasters, or is there a kind of ideological or faith-based position? Um, look, I think it's an, and it's something I was going to, going to mention. I think we're, we're actually weak in that area. Um, there's lots of individual Quakers, and myself included, who are doing um, work. <laughs> in my case, as you said, <clears throat> um, heavily involved in, in restorative justice education in the prisons of Zululand. Um, but the, the, there's, and there are many Quakers who uh, have got, who belong to, to faith based organizations, which got, a, including ASAFSI. Um, uh, which Gabriel uh, spoke about, um, but we we don't have um, strong representation in Southern Africa. Elsewhere, yes, there is as, uh, as far as climate change is concerned, but elsewhere, and perhaps I'll say a bit about that in a moment. Yeah. Right. Um, should I far away? Yeah, absolutely. I've turned my camera off at the request of some of the. Uh, uh, TV, the, the, the TV media, who I think right. want the speaker to be on the screen at the moment. So, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So uh, I'm a little, going to be a little bit academic to start with and, and, and hope to improve as I go. Um, but I want to start off by saying, I don't think we realise just how important civil society organisations are in, in South Africa and in Africa more generally. Um, 
uh, I, I'm an Australian originally, uh, and I, I visited there a few months ago. And uh, one of my sort of impressions was everything works, <laughs> and governments work. If you go into a government office or you from, they work, um, and and things are, are handled well. Whereas we often have the impression here is no, not very much about government works <laughs> at all. Uh, I think we're, we're perhaps we're exaggerating, but but in that sort of context civil society is really important. And DR Congo, where I've, uh, which I've visited two or three times now, um, one of the, the very strong um, features of, of Congo is that governments don't work, but civil society, and especially through faith-based organization, works remarkably. And uh, <clears throat> so I think that's one, and they work in terms of relief, and they work in terms of development, and they work by trying to push government to behave better and, and so on. So that's my first point. I think really um, <clears throat> civil society is actually hugely powerful. And uh, yeah, the second point <clears throat> um, is that um, you know, moving to resilient societies, um, which is one of our interests, of course. Resilient societies are built on love. Now, I'm so pleased to be able to not focus on just academic things and to move into things like that. But I'm going to quote you from an article that comes from a, a British magazine. Um, and talking about the importance of love when it comes to the climate crisis. And so and she starts off by saying, um, we, we are going to need major technological fixes. Uh, windmills to decarbonize our energy systems. Flood defenses against rising seas and air conditioners to survive heat waves. We'll need many more technological fixes and much faster than they're coming now. But just as essential to our survival are social fixes. Now love is often seen as a charming but irrelevant character, characteristic in our, in our species story and the remit of poets. But love, is what draws us together to forge the strong, caring societies that make us so successful as a species. And it is love that will ultimately save us from the climate crisis. That's a pretty powerful statement. And I think we in, in Africa generally, in South Africa perhaps particularly, um, talk about Ubuntu, um, and a, which is, a, probably an equivalent word, because love is much more than a feeling. I mean, it is a feeling, um, but it's much more than that. Uh, it seems to me that it, it, centrally it's a commitment to the well-being of other people and a commitment that might well put their interests way ahead of ours. And we heard some stories from MTOs about that, that type of willingness. A willingness to share not to hang on to what we've got. And I think the Ubuntu needs to be very wide. Um, okay, we understand Ubuntu in your own immediate family circles and so on. But Ubuntu if, and love need to go beyond that and to be without boundaries. Um, it, in the extreme form, if we think about the Sermon on the Mount, for example, it includes loving our competitors and loving our enemies. That's uh, a pretty big, uh, what's the word? it's a high bar, exactly. But it is what love asks of us. And for many people, of course, that's not natural. Um, uh, it's not natural to put other people ahead of you, of you, especially if they're people with whom you're competing or, uh, or even with whom you have a very strained relationship. But it seems to me that that's one thing that faith-based uh, um, organizations uh, have got a, a, a remit a responsibility to do, to keep on hammering away at it, to say, love is a supreme um, supreme virtue, go for it, practice it on, on, a, on a daily basis. So first two points, there's only one major point to follow, but civil society is extremely significant and we often underestimate it in that sense. 
Secondly, resilient societies, to which civil society can is, is obviously plays a major role, um, is built or are built on love, of concern for the other, no matter who they are. And the third point is that while individual behaviour is very important, it is not enough. And I'll quote you from another article I read. Um, it's the title, and I'm happy to send it to anyone who might like, is How Can Friends Help Save Our Planet? Now, friends is a, a, a term that's often used for Quakers, so how can Quakers help save our planet? And um, the authors talk about how changing our personal lifestyles alone will not do very much. Now, for many of us, we, we practice a particular type of lifestyle if we're interested in the environment. There are things we do and there are things we don't do. But it's not going to make much effect. Just uh, how many people are with us at the moment? Well, it's, I think it was 70 before. But 70 people practicing that is going to go a small way of making a difference. We have to go beyond uh, just individual behavior. And um, the article has a very interesting little discussion of our carbon footprints. And um, I'm going to quote it again because it says it very well. Imagine my shock when I learned that much of the hype around our carbon footprints has come from fossil fuel companies. The idea of a personal carbon footprint was popularized back in 2005 by a large advertising campaign by BP, one of the world's biggest oil and gas companies. And it says, go on, go ahead and calculate your own carbon footprint and do something about it. And what the article says is, this strategy was aimed at shifting the blame for the negative consequences of the very profitable fossil fuel industry onto, individual, onto individuals, while BP itself made no attempt to reduce its own carbon footprint. Very interesting point. And so we have to join with others. Now, at ICON, the International Centre of Nonviolence, we uh, put a lot of effort into educating people about the effectiveness of nonviolent campaigns. And the reality is, nonviolent campaigns are more effective than violent campaigns. That's, that's the, the evidence is there, very, very clear. Um, we try and uh, train and motivate our students to take action. So we don't have them sitting in front of a computer for three years writing up a thesis. We say, you know, spend the first year doing that, and then the other two years um, undertaking an action which will bring about desired social and uh, or other, other change. So it might be bringing, two, I'll just give you one example, it might be bringing two um, ethnic groups together in a series of dialogues to help them understand each other and build relationships. So that's one, one thing on, on the icon front. And in terms of Quakers, as I said, I don't think we're, we in Southern, Southern Africa are doing it particularly well with respect to climate change. But in the US, uh, where there are also a lot of Quakers, there's a very strong lobbying uh, industry and Quakers are very strong in, in that lobbying industry. Um, and that includes bringing about uh, climate change. And uh, in, the, in that article I mentioned, how can friends uh, help save our planet? There are a number of examples of things that Quakers in the US in particular uh, have done to, uh, to curb uh, some of the excesses of the, uh, of the fossil fuel companies. Um, my involvement, um, I plant trees incidentally, I'm a, a gorilla tree planter. So, uh, so I see a space and I think, right, there's trees going in there. So I um, love doing that. But that's one individual and maybe a few hundred trees. And that's better, certainly better than nothing, but it's not enough. Um, what I specifically do with Quakers is this, as, a, as I said, this involvement with um, uh, prisoners in, in, in prison work. And it's, it's an educational process that helps them understand themselves, uh, to take responsibility for themselves and their behavior. And in particular, to help them reconnect with their families. Because what we've realized is it's crucial 
for prisoners when they are released to be able to go back into a, a family. And the, the hard work uh, has been done. Um, there's been discussions and connections developed uh, towards the end of their, their prison sentence. So um, that's what I do in particular. Um, um, and perhaps I'll just say one other thing about Quakers. Quakers are not evangelistic. You have no, no danger about being, <laughs> perhaps a weakness of ours, we just don't do it. Um, but people find Quakers. I mean, I found them. I mean, I wasn't, uh, no one evangelized me. I was just thinking, I'm not very happy, or not so happy in the present church that I'm in. Um, and then I found Quakers. And, and they would do, I'd sort of reached the point that, they, that, they, they were, that they'd reached. And uh, so it's my, my current uh, spiritual family. So I think I'll stop at that point. Thanks, Santa. Thanks, Jeff. I, th I think you really brought a very uh, different angle to the, to the discussion. And I mean, the, the little historical tidbit about BP is really fascinating. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Of power of, of massive corporations to deflect responsibility in such a blatant way. Um, and the gorilla tree planting sounds fascinating. And I'm glad you said that you guys are not evangelistic because then it might make me want to join you on a tree planting expedition one of the days. Um, but uh, I have lots of questions for you, but in the interest of time, um, I think I'll save them for the end, uh, but maybe I'll just throw the question out there and, and you can think about a response for later. Um, and I think the emphasis on love is really interesting because we don't often hear the word love uh, being thrown out, especially in discussions about climate change, especially in webinars hosted by universities. Um, and this idea of operationalizing love um, and, and its links to Ubuntu in our context is really quite interesting. You know, so I'm, I'm really keen to kind of hear a little bit more about that um, a little bit later on. But for now, thank you, Jeff. I think you've given us lots of food for thought. Um, and let me just move on to our next panelist, uh, Yasmin Raja. Um, Yasmin is, is definitely no stranger to anyone in the NGO space in Durban. Um, she's the director of refugee social services and provides incredibly important services to refugees, asylum seekers and migrants living in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, Yasmin studied social work at the former UDW and her early career was in child and family services with communities around Durban. And her current work really involves providing critical services at some of the most vulnerable people in the province, um, especially when there's been mass displacements after incidents of xenophobic violence and more recently during the floods in KZN. And Yasmin really is in the perfect position to provide us with a very kind of on the ground grassroots update from the perspective of marginalized populations. Um, and she's really doing incredible work. Uh, Yasmin, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. And thank you for the for inviting me to actually be part of this presentation. Um, so I work for refugee social services, and the work is primarily with survivors, survivors of disasters, actually, because the people that we actually work with are people that have been persecuted on the basis of their race, religion, nationality, uh, ethnicity or belonging to a, a certain social group and they've actually fled their countries to come and seek refuge in our country and in route they've, 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 they've experienced violence um, in their countries of origin um, in mostly man-made disasters obviously in route and more often than not in, in South Africa I mean I think everybody's heard um, the issues with uh, xenophobic violence. We've had disasters uh, 2008, 2015, 2019. This organization has been working with, uh, with refugees and migrants um, since 2008, um, you know, and dealing with disasters since then. But I think what I'd like to say is that, you know, uh, when, when you introduce this particular webinar, you said, uh, based on, on, on the research that was done, that uh, people experienced multiple, multiple disasters. And I didn't realize that we were actually working, you know, aside from the xenophobic violence and stuff, that we were always working with people that had already experienced disasters. So our regular work is to assist 
um, communities to heal, to restore their dignity, uh, to integrate and to become self-reliant again. That's what we do normally every day on a day-to-day -day basis. And when there's a, a disaster, we deal with small disasters and big disasters, maybe not, not as massive as Gift of the Givers and others that are national organizations, but we deal with in, within the communities, little disasters like fires, oftentimes, To find more often than not is the community is um, often ignored or marginalized. So even during the floods, well, let me let, let me start with COVID, which I, I see as a disaster as well. During COVID, the first thing that happened was our clients were um, were ignored. They were not uh, considered for assistance. They were not because their documents were not the same as South Africans. They, some of them were undocumented. So, um, and this comes up quite often. Uh, people that we actually work with are, are, are seen as other and are not in need of, of uh, assistance. Or maybe they're just uh, invisible. So during this uh, this flood, for instance, we, sorry, let me go back. So whenever there's a disaster, we often find that we're, we're the center, together with other people in the sector that work with migrants and refugees, have to actually take on um, the gap and actually try and see how we can help. And usually we're very good at um, getting funding from our regular funders to provide some sort of service to the communities that are affected, uh, whether it's a small disaster or a big disaster. Um, and now during the floods, what we, we, we've, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have felt, oh, well, it was the informal settlements and, and that that were affected. But in our case, what we noticed that within the informal set settlements, there's a number of uh, migrants. There were refugees that were in and around uh, uh, Devon that were affected. And basically what we, 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 we did was try and get some assistance to them. We would work uh, generally with giving immediate assistance, but more often than not also giving assistance after that. One of the things that our organization has been pretty good at doing is uh, building safe spaces for refugees and migrants to actually come and seek assistance. Oftentimes people don't know that they, they, they're there. The people in the community don't know where to get the help from. And it is through our regular work with people within the community, community leaders, uh, people that we've uh, engaged with on a regular basis, people that we've picked up with strengths and, and, and um, skills that we've trained as uh, peer educators in the community that have come out and referred all of these invisible uh, survivors out there. So like, for instance, during this particular flood, um, it came after a lot of uh, engagement and, 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 and um, xenophobic, the xenophobic anti-immigrant anti sentiment that was coming from Dudula. Actually, the day the floods hit us was the day that the doula la launched in Durban. And basically what it did was that even though migrants and refugees were, were impacted by, um, by the floods, a number of them didn't go to the shelters. They tended to go and, um, um, you know, sort of seek refuge with friends if they had them, or else just try and figure out how to, to manage. We're, we're one of the few organizations that um, have actually um, made sure that we provided, found the invisible, tried to find the invisible um, and, and the unseen and make sure that they were included in whatever um, assistance there is to offer. One of the things, I think uh, one of the briefs that was given to me was show the lessons that you've learned on the ground. And one of the big things for us 
is to find the people within the community that actually have uh, strengths and skills that can be trained and who we can actually partner with. So we've, over the years, built huge networks of people that we work with. So reaching out even into like areas like Newcastle or the outer reaches of uh, um, KZN and making sure where we can that people know that we're here and that we're here to actually assist. We've used um, means like WhatsApp and, and, and um, social media to actually do assessments, to actually um, do counseling and to actually um, provide uh, uh, um, assistance. One of the things that we do um, is we, we've chosen not to go the route, when we're doing assistance, we've cho chosen not to go the route of exclusive food vouchers and food um, and, and um, material sort of assistance in that way. What we normally do is we've moved to assisting people with cash because we feel that it is important that they have uh, the ability to actually know what they need. And, you know, they can buy things like electricity, they can buy food, they can buy, uh, they can use their money for transport um, and stuff like that. So when we're doing physical assistance, this is one of the things that we would do. We always provide a space for people to speak. We've, uh, uh, we, we, um, normally would uh, make sure that when people come to our, and, and this is work that actually happens before a disaster. So when people come into the country and if they come to our office and we, we've done assessments and stuff like that, what we would normally do is try and connect them up with others in the same situation as themselves. Because one of the big things that happens is that people lose their support net networks when they leave their countries of origin. They don't speak usually don't speak the languages of South Africans. And when they get here, there's a, a great sense of loss and of not knowing uh, where and how to, 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 to connect. Some people will find their churches eventually, they'll find people in their communities eventually, but they, they, they're dealing with all of the same issues that South Africans and poor South Africans are dealing with. And there's a need always to, to encourage connections and to uh, encourage and, and, and to, to identify the, the strengths and the skills within this community so that the community itself helps each other. So we're basically, in a lot of ways, a catalyst. We do, we, do, we, we collaborate with a number of other organizations. Uh, um, there's a number of faith-based organizations. There's a number of uh, um, NGOs and CBOs that we actually connect up with so that we can provide services to a community that is generally quite marginalized. Um, and what we also hope in, in, in the work that we do is to, to restore dignity and to, to get people from within the community to see that they have something to offer. And they offer this up to their own communities as well. Um, I think the strength in our organization is the fact that we've had, we have very diverse staff. Uh, we make sure as far as possible, another lesson, we make sure as far as possible that we have people that can actually speak in the languages that um, our community speaks so that they can they can connect and they can be um, assisted in a language that they understand. It must be very, very difficult to have to explain to somebody what you need and how you're feeling when you don't speak a language. And for this reason, what we have actually done is we've trained people in the community as lay counselors so that they can hold the community together. Um, I know I've gone all over the place uh, because I don't see us as a disaster um, organization. It's, it's something that we do all the time. We just get in there and we work. I think I would like to, to say one of, you know, one of the main things I would like to say to whoever's on this particular uh, webinar is that let's not ignore the issues of documentation because once a person is undocumented, 
at, uh, or, or has, not given, has not been given a document that is recognized, what then happens is that they become invisible. It's like they don't exist. And um, in South Africa, unfortunately, even though we have very progressive laws and stuff, um, when we're doing, when we're planning for services and when we're planning even for disasters, the, 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 the issue of documentation is always a barrier. And I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yasmin. Uh, every time I chat to you, I'm always so impressed with the amount of work that you guys are doing uh, under really difficult circumstances. Um, and especially given the funding landscape uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure that's taken a strain on you guys as well as it has with, with most NGOs. Um, I think one of the questions I had, but I mean, I, I want to ask you to respond right now, just in the interest of time, but I'll just kind of leave it out there, which is, um, you know, when you were speaking, I was wondering about whether during times like the floods in KZN, has there been increased solidarity between refugee communities and um, kind of South Africans? Or has our notorious label of being a very xenophobic country uh, become even worse during times of disasters. And I see already people in the chat have spoken about climate change, refugees and forced displacements of communities, et cetera. So, you know, I was quite interested to know whether we kind of band together in times of disaster or whether we still continue to go our separate ways. Uh, but I'm gonna move over to our next panelist and hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for discussion at the end, even though I can see we're fast running out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much for your contributions, Yasmin. Just to introduce our final panelist, who is Dr. Kosi Kubeka, who is a senior lecturer joining us from Cape Town. She's based in the Department of Social Development at UCT and is a qualified social worker. Uh, originally from Soweto, Dr. Kubeka is a Buddhist and a lifelong believer in the power of the youth. So Kosi, I'm hoping today that you'll be able to speak a little bit about youth participation um, and, and how they are playing a, a role in terms of climate change. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm sure it's getting increasingly freezing in Cape Town this time of year. <laughs> Um, so over to you. It's wet and very cold in Cape Town today. Um, may I share a screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, we go. All right. Um, yes, it's it's very wet and and cold in Cape Town today. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here. Such an inspirational um, you know, webinar. Um, the information shared today um, is so powerful. And thank you for inviting me to also participate and speak at this very important public webinar um, hosted by the University of Oguazulu Natal, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Ngama. Um, as stated in the introduction, I am an academic at UCT. I, my research focuses on youth developmental well-being with special interest on youth participation uh, in, in um, on youth participation in and inclusion in all aspects of community development. Uh, just a minute, sorry, I just realized I'm not in share in uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Let me just do that quickly, apologies. All right, there we go. Yeah, as I said, I, my, my focus is on youth participation and inclusion in all aspects of all community development. Um, in addition to being an academic, as you said, I am a member of the Soka Kagai International uh, SGI, a global community-based Buddhist organization led by Daisaku Ikeda, who is um, a peace activist and an educator who in 2013 was conferred with an honorary doctorate from the, from the University of KwaZulu Natal. As SGI members, we practice Buddhism to overcome personal challenges, realize our full potential and promote peace in society. Buddhism teaches us to find the depth of our own inner potential and encourage, encourage others to do so. I was 20 years old when I started practicing Buddhism. It has enabled me to overcome self-doubt, realize my full potential and find my voice. My worldview expanded to a point where I could see my role as an uplifter and driver of change in my physical and social environment. Buddhism respects and embraces life, all life. Whatever our differences, Buddhist philosophy maintains that we are inextricably linked to one another and the planet we all inhabit. 
I would like to introduce some of the key principles from my faith, which can give us the philosophical and ethical framework in response to the challenges of climate change in South Africa. The first principle is interconnectedness also known as the theory of dependent origination, which explains that everything is connected and is interdependent. In other words, nothing exists in isolation, including our relationship with the natural world that we inhabit. Similar to the concept of Ubuntu, our, our um, existence only becomes meaningful through our interaction with and in relation to others, as well as our physical environment. In his 2014 peace proposal, Daisaku Ikeda talks about the rise of nationalism and makes a case that nationalism is, count, is counterproductive. Therefore, to create a sustainable environment, we must counter nationalism and instead promote global uh, solidarity. Interconnectedness recognizes that all things in the universe are connected, are one. Therefore, to hurt or impair something in your environment is to harm yourself and all things. The second principle is oneness of self or, of, or life or env an environment. This principle describes the inseparability of life of, of the individual and the environment. Although it sounds a bit like interconnectedness, the focus is slightly different. It is common it is a common tendency to blame our problems to things outside of ourselves. However, the principle of oneness of life and its environment demonstrates that the environment reflects the life states of the beings who live in it. We can take full responsibility for our environment by changing ourselves first. In my practice, we speak of a process of inner transformation referred to as human revolution. Daisaku Ikeda has described the outcome of this process as follows. I quote, a great human revolution in just a single individual will help achieve a change in the destiny of a nation and further will enable a change in the destiny of all humankind, I unquote. As Buddhists, we engage in the process of human revolution to elevate our life state. In turn, our consciousness expands and we recognize our fundamental goodness. Ultimately, it all comes down to the choices we make in how we live our lives. The destruction we see in of our environment stems from the cumulative and collective decisions and behaviors of human beings who inhabit the planet. Therefore, we need to each embrace our part in saving the planet. Um, as we commit to enhance, improve, and act based on our highest life state, our environment will naturally improve. One of the findings of the PLOS uh, climate paper is that the likelihood of depression resulting from exposure to community disaster was particularly higher among Black African females who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Although climate change is one of the key drivers of disasters in sub-Saharan Africa, there is not enough attention to it and, and how it impacts one of the most socially vulnerable groups, that is the Black youth from resource poor communities. Young people make up 63.3% of the South African population. And as um, Gabriel mentioned in his presentation, they are the most vulnerable. They, and when it comes to disasters and, and social economic position, they are the most vulnerable. Um, they are the generation that will be most affected by climate change. But they also the generation that can shape the efforts to prevent the destruction of our planet. To enable youth to take lead in climate change activism, I propose two focal areas. First, Young people can bring creative and resourceful ideas to disaster preparedness efforts. This can help not only to increase their awareness of particular hazards, but it can also equip them with skills and knowledge they can use to protect their families and loved ones and to understand how to seek help um, should their communities um, who are affected need. 
They can act as change makers in developing disaster preparedness plans like toolkit and toolkits um, that they can share with their communities and families. Youth must become aware that they are the, they are the leading actors who have agency, which means that they are able to make life choices. How they live their lives will be reflected in the environment. They must develop the awareness of the connection between their action and the environment. Second, to successfully meet the climate change challenges facing South Africa, it is vital to continually revisit such questions as what is it that we want to protect? Who should protect it and how? We must start from the perspective of those most severely impacted and work with them to find a path towards resolutions. Dialogue centered on the dignity of each individual provides the framework for this. To this end, we need to promote and encourage dialogue led by youth. Youth must take the stage and engage in dialogue with themselves and with others, and they must also create spaces for dialogue within their communities. They need to be empowered to recognize that they are the protagonists of climate change, claiming their leadership and advocacy. So in closing, those who have experienced the greatest suffering have invaluable lessons and capacities to share. As an academic who is passionate about youth development, I sincerely hope that community-based organizations and faith-based organizations who know the community very well and are often the first responders can foster youth leadership in a more inclusive and equitable manner to effectively address climate change. And happy Youth Month, everybody. Thank you so much, Kosi, for that uh, succinct but absolutely informative and interesting presentation. Um, I was trying to remember the one quote by uh, Kumi Naidu, who was the former uh, director of Greenpeace, and I quickly Googled it while you were talking, and I think it's worth repeating. And you know, Kumi Naidu said that the most important thing you can do as a young person in the world today is to become a climate activist. Become this for change, or there will be no future to change. We have no plan B because there's no planet B. And I think it's uh, really kind of wise words and links quite directly to the kind of uh, message that you're also advocating. Um, and indeed, you know, if uh, young people are going to be the future, we actually need a future in which we can go into. Um, and indeed, there is no planet B. Thank you so much, uh, Kosi. And you've actually brought us right on the dot of half past three, which is when we are supposed to end the webinar. But I'm going to just um, take some leeway as the moderator and, and just ask the indulgence of the panelists for just five, maximum 10 minutes. So we can just respond to any questions that we have from the audience. Um, and if obviously participants or attendees need to leave, then uh, thank you for attending and making time today for this hour and a half. I know it's not easy, uh, especially in the middle of a day, but are there any questions from our attendees? Um, I think we maybe have space for two or maybe three, if you'd like to just raise your electronic hand and then you can unmute yourself and ask a question to any one of our panelists. I see there's been lots of commentary in the chat box. Uh, lots of people have asked questions in the Q&A box as well. Uh, but just in case, because I know there's lots of expertise also sitting in the participant list. And I know lots of people who've tuned in to listen are themselves uh, really at the forefront of engaging in community and faith-based organizations themselves. So I did not want to miss the opportunity just to listen to anybody else that'd like to engage with the panelists. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds. If I don't see any hands, then I will take that as an indication that the panelists were quite complete. <laughs> okay, uh, Salvin Pambiran, I see your hands up. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, go ahead, Salvin. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for a wonderful topic and well hosted. Uh, very informative. Um, a lot of the organizations point out to the fact that um, how they respond 
and I'm talking specifically to uh, climate change, um, flooding, for example, especially KZN. Now, what we should also look at is how can we as society, government, etc., go about changing how we do what we do in terms of building homes, bridges, uh, roads, etc., to mitigate uh, climate change. Uh, because what has happened is um, the intensity of uh, climate change being either whether it's a drought, it's much more severe, and whether it's a flood, it's much more intense. So the intensity has increased, and what we are doing is uh, we are using the same old uh, mechanical structures, etc., technology. So we need to, to actually change our thinking. We need to look out the box. We need to look what is happening in other countries that's successful. We need to combine. I think the mindsets need to change. Uh, for example, uh, our organization, the Habitat Foundation, we work specifically with a grass. And the grass is called the, the vetiver grass, which originates from the south of India. And I think a lot of the audience will uh, be familiar with this grass. It has the unique characteristics of a growing root structure, which is three meters plus. And I've been overseas, I've traveled for conferences uh, to a few countries around the world. And they use this very successfully in holding mechanical, uh, sorry, in holding massive banks uh, on freeways, in agricultural lands, uh, and in rural areas. And uh, so the vetiver system is uh, very popular, popular and successfully used uh, all over the world. Uh, we have it here. We based at the Dubai Trade Port at the uh, International King Shaka International Airport, and we'd like for organisations to get in touch with us. We cannot get into government; it's it's extremely difficult to talk about a humble grass. And then we have mindsets that need to change because it's a very unique grass. So I think that's very important mindsets and how we look for solutions uh, going forward. Thank you, Salvin. Um, if you don't mind just popping your details into the chat, and if anyone would like to get in touch with you, then they can do that. Um, are there any other questions from anyone in the audience? Well, if there isn't any more, uh, perhaps I can just do one round of a very, very short closing commentary by our panelists. And... Um, Jeff, maybe I can start with you. Um, any kind of uh, last words of wisdom that you'd like to leave us with? Well, it's been an inspiration to me. <laughs> and sometimes I think, well, I have not too much spare capacity in my life, but I, I think there are things that I could, um, I, uh, perhaps the, uh, they've reached their use-by date with me, and uh, you know, I really would like to get involved in a, in an organisational sense with um, uh, organisations dealing with climate change. So I've been inspired. So that's that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for bringing the word love into this into this webinar as well. And I see that <laughs> love sent your way even in the chat. Uh, Gabriel, some closing comments from you? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Santosh. I think what I would want to say is maybe more coordination even amongst the trade groups so that um, together we can actually work on the areas that are vulnerable and get to assist people in those areas. Because at the moment, it's something that we already know that it's not going to go away soon. Therefore, we need to plan accordingly. And as has already been said, with love to care for others that are not able to care for themselves. I think it is very, very important for us to go that route and for everybody to actually have the empathy to feel for those people who are out there. And maybe each time the rain season comes, people begin to think of what has happened before and there is need for us to support the communities and also to engage the authorities to make something happen in terms of moving people to safer grounds. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gabriel. I think that word empathy is absolutely important, you know, and it's maybe something that we need to speak a lot more about. Uh, Yasmin, closing comments from you. I'll, I'll leverage your word solidarity. I think um, all these disasters um, give us an opportunity to actually build solidarity with communities that are vulnerable and, you know, sitting in, 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 in a panel with uh, people from so many different organizations with different functions. I think we need to see how we can leverage whatever happens across the board um, yeah, basically, let's make the best of a crisis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yasmin. And uh, Kosi, final word to you. You know, Sant Santosh, when I finished my presentation, you mentioned the quote about young people becoming climate activists, mm -hmm. climate change activists. We do have quite a few. I was reading about um, like the top 10 um, climate change, youth climate change activists in Africa and two of our youth in South Africa are represented. Mm -hmm. And I also read about this young woman in Kailicha recently. Her name is Yola Mkogwana, who is changing and who is, who is, who is pushing um, you know, her community in Kailicha to be more responsible in the way in which um, they, 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 they um, get rid of littering. So, um, you know, young people, if one, what these are isolated cases, but um, what when it comes to young people, you need mass mobilization. And as we have seen, we know, I mean, especially those of us who work in academia, you know, who have been through the fees must fall and roads must fall. We know when young people get together and mobilize, they, 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 um, they, they can shift things. At the moment in our universities, they have forced us to have very critical conversations about transformation and inclusivity. So um, if young people can be, you know, can be the lead, um, you know, take the lead in climate change activism, you know, we can see a change. I'm hoping that, you know, in the future, you know, we continue to have these public dialogues. I'm hoping that we get to a point where such dialogues are led by young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kosi. And um, I would just like to once again thank uh, Dr. Andrew Tomita for leading the study that was published in PLOS One. If you haven't read it, uh, do Google it. And for initiating this webinar and for inviting me to facilitate. And thank you also to uh, Marianne Francis in the background who has been uh, part of organizing this from the College of Health Sciences. And thank you everybody for attending today um, and for taking time out of your busy schedules to engage with us, to listen to our speakers. And thank you to all our speakers, each one of you, is doing amazing work in your respective spaces. And I think perhaps the take home message today, um, although it's hard to really distill a take home message from such a, a great diversity and wealth of information is that we do need way more solidarity and not just amongst those of us in society, but also even amongst faith-based organizations and community organizations in the NGO and NPO space, because obviously together we can do much more and together we are stronger. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day further. And thank you to all our speakers for giving of your time. And thank you 